From news and product reviews to husbandry, habitat, and conservation, we discuss all things reptile. With special guests from all around the world, we talk about the reptiles we keep, the unique ways we keep them, and how we can work together to push herpetoculture forward and preserve the species we love. From the guys who brought you Greg's Reptile Studio and Hudson Valley Reptile and Rescue, this is The Reptile Studio. Hey everybody, welcome to the Reptile Studio podcast with me, uh, Greg from Greg's Reptile Studio and Brian from Hudson Valley Reptile and Rescue. Uh, With us today we have Christian Cave from uh, the Caveman Wildlife Crew uh, on Twitter, I mean on Instagram. And is your TikTok the same? Yes. Yes. Same handle? Yeah, Caveman Wildlife Crew on TikTok. I know on TikTok you guys have like I want to say 200 and some thousand followers. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, sure. yeah, yeah. That's it's a pretty uh, substantial number. <laughs> um, and Christian is like an avid, you know, wildlife herper. You know, specific. You know, uh, specifically, you know, herping. You know, like you know, reptiles and you know stuff like that. So, uh, welcome to the podcast. I, I'm pretty sure I. Did that intro pretty well? Yeah, you did good. I don't know. You have to tell me because I suck at all. I suck at all this stuff. You did fine. You did okay. fine. <laughs> um. So, Christian, how's it going? Ah, uh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Yeah, just you know, uh, finishing off uh, studying today and tomorrow with a for a chemistry final, and then I'm out of school for the summer. So, pretty excited oh, about great. that. <laughs> how's the weather where you are? You know, it sucks. <laughs> we don't talk about Bruno. No, <laughs> no, I don't want to hear about the weather in Georgia. I'm staring out my window here in New York state and like, uh, I think it's 40 and rain. That's yeah, gross. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Well, we had a little bit of rain, but we're, we're in the eighties and seventies now. Oh so. my God. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, is it too, can we stop this recording and pick someone else? <laughs> <laughs> somebody with worse weather someone, someone that lives in like yeah. maine yeah <laughs> seattle something like that <laughs> yeah portland there you go let's go to portland yeah uh, it's actually christian I have, a, I have a question what uh if you could describe what you do in your own words you know what what do you think that would be what does that sound like um if i could describe what we do in, in my own words i'd say that we're young and upcoming and enthusiastic avid wildlife educators um and we're, we're still uh, i always like to emphasize to people that we're still very much learning and you know i'm still in school and all of us and we're fairly new to the whole herping world i mean truthfully when we started the caveman wildlife crew we're trying to be geared towards like all things like i i, I told brian earlier like my, my first passion was insects actually so a lot of my first videos going if you go way early back are a lot of like praying mantises and crazy spiders and tiger beetles and things like that and i plan to make a resurgence of those things but it was kind of like as we started getting more out into this um, educational platform, we started noticing that like, okay, people need to be a little bit more educated on animals if they stigmatize rather, rather than like, you know, the fluffy and furry stuff. So while at some point, you know, I want, we want to do birds and, you know, all types of mammals right now, it's been like, okay, like what do people really need to hear about? So they don't kill. It's like some little snakes, you know, and, and, and a lot of different types of spiders and insects and things like that. And so, yeah, I, I'd, I'd say that would be my definition for us. We're just wildlife educators that are uh, young and upcoming and are down to learn and are trying to learn, but are also trying to teach along the way. Yeah, that's that's also that's that's why I was, you know, happy that you agreed to be on the podcast. I like talking to people who are like, you know, out there you know, <laughs> doing things like out in the wild, you know, doing things like that, you know, to try and bring some, you know, shine some light on on you know other areas of of life that are a little less common but just mm-hmm. as important you know so that's that's pretty good thank um, you yeah so your crew uh so it's it's you um so... <laughs> i had the names <laughs> I knew you're they, I, they're totally gone now <laughs> who do you work with <laughs> <laughs> i um so currently the, the crew is uh, myself um, and then of course, and then um, my good friend, Bobby Harden Jr. And then another good friend of mine, Riley McGreevy. 
these are all guys that I uh, grew up with and went to high school with. Bobby is uh, the oldest out of the bunch. He was a grade above me. And um, how we how we all met each other, we all met each other in different ways. Uh, Ryland and I, we knew each other since seventh grade. Like we've been friends since like forever. But Bobby and I met right when I graduated out of high school and I was um, trying to like figure out like what college program I wanted to go into and just things like that. And I figured I'd ask somebody who was well along the way in the area that I wanted to be involved in. And so, cause uh, at the time I was very much into like theater and performing and stuff like that. And so Bob, that's Bobby's whole thing. I think Bobby's an actor. And so I just reached out to him and on a whim to talk to him about how to get into that world. And he's just one of those people, you know, you hit it off with instantly. And next thing you know, he's out there filming me catch snakes and stuff like that and all that stuff. So yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky to have those young guys in my life. They've, they've been really pivotal and just helped me learn and just helping the page grow. Nice. Uh, you got anything, uh, any questions or anything? Uh... Me? Yeah. I, I couldn't remember. <laughs> you forget my name now too, Greg? Jeez. <laughs> Goodness gracious. It's rough. It's a, it's a rough it's day rough. if you forgot my name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I guess, you know, it's great to put together a crew that you can really trust and rely on. And uh, in, in our industry and in, in here in New York, it was always hard to find somebody who could film for me um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> personally. And that's one of the reasons why I don't have a lot of like video stuff is because I like to produce fine products. Not I'm, I'm old school. So it's not about like, Hey, just whip out your phone and shoot on site and say whatever you think comes to mind. I'm more of a very polished product that I like to release. Um, mm -hmm. And it's one of those situations that I, I, I admire people like yourself who have a tight knit group of people that can be there on a moment's notice and, and, and film that scenario and film that situation. And, and it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of good stuff. I really do like your content. I, uh, I was Thanks. looking at some of it on Instagram. I did not know you were on TikTok. I will find you on TikTok. I am also on TikTok. <laughs> nice. Um, oh. Not that I want to say that out loud personally, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's all about the, the, where to reach people. So regardless of the stigma behind I'm too old for TikTok or any of those other crazy things, at yeah. the end of the day, I will produce my educational content just like you are mm -hmm. anywhere that I possibly can. And oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And it's good. And don't be, don't be, don't be afraid to share, you know, don't, don't, uh, that was one of those things that happened to me. I was very, very, very hesitant to, not fall into or to fall into that category on Facebook back in the day, because when I first started doing this, Facebook was kind of it. Um, <laughs> and I was, you know, you post a picture and then you get 30 negative comments about how your, your enclosure isn't the right thing or the right size oh, or the right, right shape or the right. I, I, I'm done with all that. Yeah. I, I have been doing this too long. I respect people's opinions and I will definitely evaluate my husbandry. If somebody says something in a, in a positive construct, not a negative way. Oh yeah. Um, but at the same point in time, I think there's a way to help a beginner and it's not to demonize their picture that they thought they were sharing to be really <laughs> humble and happy. And here's my animal. It's amazing. And then you're like, that is not how you do it. You know? And I just, I, I don't know. So I never posted when I was younger. And I mean, you know, the animals that came in and out of the rescue, we're talking huge gators. We're talking, uh, I had a more let's crocodile. I had came in, I had all kinds of awesome, awesome, awesome creatures that like, I wish I still had that I could film and record and talk about because here in New York state, as everyone knows, our laws have changed and mm. uh, we gave up those licenses a while ago, but I digress. It's a, uh, don't ever let yourself fall into that trap of the hesitation, you I know, agree. just, yeah. just do it. Your stuff is great. Keep going. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Really. I mean, a lot really. Yeah. It, I've, uh, I've, I've had no shortage of, uh, I guess the best way to put them is a uh, pejorative comments and not at times and things like that. And so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes it gets, uh, it gets to you, like, especially when it's sometimes are by people in the community that you, you admire, you know, you know, at some points and, you know, you get, you know, I've been added to some, a group chat before, you know, and all these herpers, you know, are kind of, you know, on my head about certain things or, you know, I think I, uh, I had mistaked like a, a, I was down in South Georgia and mistaked a heterodon sinus like for platy rhinos or something like that after yeah. like yeah. five and a half hours of road cruising. You, but know? you know what, you know what, man. And I'm going to tell you this from the, from the, from the bottom of 
watching people talk about animals for, for I'm 39 years old. So watching people talk about animals for 39 plus years, excuse me, for 28 plus years, you know, when I was 10, <laughs> um, everyone gets things wrong. Oh yeah. Most of the people that we grew up watching with the exception of Steve Irwin aren't animal people. <laughs> The, uh, the gentleman who did the Columbus Zoo, I can't remember his name right now. Greg, help me out. Jack Hanna. Mm. Jack Hanna got things wrong all the time. <laughs> all the time. And nobody <laughs> called him on it. And there's nothing wrong with that because what he did for that zoo was incredible. Mm -hmm. right? you know, and I mean, David Attenborough was a naturalist and even he's gotten things wrong. And he's one of the most famous narrator naturalists on the planet. Oh, yeah. uh, Jeff Corwin has gotten things wrong. Austin Stevens, Mark O'Shea, they all get things wrong and there's nothing wrong with getting things wrong. The problem is, is that our society focuses on the one thing somebody gets wrong instead of the 400 things that they've done right, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, I think I saw a post a couple months ago where it was like 20 math problems in a row and then the last one was wrong. And it was like, you know, this is a, this is a societal thing. Nobody paid attention to the other 19 that I got right everybody wants to tell me about the one that I got wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We're all quick to point out each other's mistakes. Oh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not like that. And believe me, I will be following your stuff more, more, uh, more readily, you know, <laughs> to our, to our listeners. I only just started watching his stuff this morning, just so we're very clear. Uh, <laughs> I have watched several. I definitely, um, I definitely enjoyed the content of the five or six videos that I got in before we did this podcast. And I'm a very busy guy. I, mm -hmm. I will probably binge watch a bunch of your stuff later on this afternoon, uh, <laughs> or I might, I might throw it on in the background while I'm uh, cleaning and feeding and, and doing all of the wonderful chores that, that entail uh, uh, a company keeping reptiles. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, that's, that's a perfect segue actually. So we had a little bit of a discussion before this, uh, this, I started recording the podcast and uh, Christian, you don't keep reptiles personally, correct? No, I don't. No, I don't. You want to tell yeah. me a little bit about that? So, uh, you know, funny thing is, growing up, you know, I, I can remember asking my parents for like a, a woma python or a pair of satanic leaf geckos or something like that for like the longest time because I was always super into like all types of reptiles and things like that. I envy but, your childhood. Yeah. <laughs> always, you know, always was asking them, always was asking them for stuff like that. You know, oh, can I get a bull python? Can I get this? Can I get that? And there, my mom is a, my mom is definitely afraid of snakes. Like my mom is definitely afraid of snakes and oh, uh, reptiles and things like that. And my, uh, my dad, he's not definitely afraid of them, but he's just more of like, hey, okay, well, you know, you just leave it over there in the woods type thing. And so um, none of them belong in the house, but they did allow me to keep in insects so I, I grew up just keeping tons of insects and then my dad used to keep freshwater fish so he, okay. uh, when I got interested in those he helped me foster my curiosity for those and so I had a bunch of fish tanks and I had tons of all types of types of different insects and arachnids and things like that um, but I just never got to own reptiles and okay. then when I started caveman wildlife and I started getting out in the field that was really where most of my interactions with reptiles actually came from in amphibians and I don't know. I just kind of got like a, I kind of got more and more invested into like the caveman crew type stuff into where I'm like, I'm at the point where I could, you know, I could probably own a reptile now, but I just, I haven't thought about if I did, which one I would want, you know, or anything like that at the moment. I'm just kind of like, oh, okay, this is just kind of right. cool. And I, I follow, it's funny because I follow the reptile hobby a lot. Like I'm, I'm, I'm very much invested in it on social media and things like that. I follow a lot of people and I still watch a lot of different YouTube content creators and things like that. And, and it's, a really fascinating hobby, but I just haven't actually, I can't say, yeah, I can't say I've ever been a reptile keeper of, you know, maybe I've held a skink in a cage or something like that for, you know, a period of time while it got caught in a glue trap and I was trying to make sure it was okay after, but I've never like owned that pet reptile. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm. And, um, what's, what's your favorite reptile that you, uh, that you have, I guess, rescued or, or, or even, even something, um, like you were mentioning the satanic leaf tail geckos and, and woma python what what was that one species that you were like oh but mom come on <laughs> the one species that i was like oh but mom come on because i thought it was the one that i could sell her the most on because we went to a pet store and they were somewhat cute to her was uh the uh good old you know the, the staple leopard gecko um 
I really wanted a leopard gecko as a kid just growing up. I always, I really wanted one of those. They, they're just so cool. And I, I would go over to friends' houses and sometimes they'd have one or something like that. And I'd be like, oh man, they're that's awesome. So neat. Or something like that. But right. yeah. But um, Uh-oh. yeah, that's just, that's kind of where I, uh, I, yeah, what happened, of- Greg? <laughs> no, it got silent. I thought something happened to the sound. I thought the sound went out or something. Oh, oh yeah, no, no, no. I, I thought somebody was going to say something, so I stopped. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was kind of funny. But um, yeah, probably the leopard gecko. Um, I'm a big gecko guy, and and then um, monitor lizards have always interested me, but I don't, I don't know if I'll ever. I, my neighbor, who's an evolutionary zoologist, he he had a novel monitor and he tells me stories about how uh, crazy that thing was and so that's what i've heard i don't know (laughs) yeah there are there are several species there are several species now uh in captivity that do make fairly decent captives Mm. um nile monitors are forever going to be one that does not make a very good captive at all Uh, (laughs) especially for especially for just about anybody i mean really this is an animal that at some point in its life is going to require something the size of an entire room yeah. Really, logistically speaking, you know, I mean, they're they're massive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, you know, I part part of me respects a lot about the uh, your unwillingness to dive right in and go buy that pet reptile as an mm-hmm. as an adult now, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's a really good lesson for a lot of people who might watch this uh, to understand is that even though you find them fascinating. It doesn't mean you have to go buy one. It yeah. does. It does. There is a there is a point where, you know, yes, are they readily available? Yes. Can you go to PetSmart and Petco or, or your local pet shop and go buy one for $30 right now? Of course you can. But yeah. not understanding that the environment that they're going to inhabit is going to cost several hundred dollars, especially a leopard gecko. You know, mm-hmm. when you when you tell somebody that their setup needs to be like two hundred dollars from a pet store obviously we we here at the rescue we adopt out and we uh 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 uh, sell equipment very very cheap to make sure that that animal can be taken care of properly um but it's not about the if you tell somebody that they have to spend two hundred dollars on the setup forget the lizard people are like what well you you tell somebody about a savannah monitor savannah monitors are a fairly small uh staple wild caught species that comes into the united states in the millions every year um probably thousands i should not over exaggerate that (laughs) and uh you know this is a creature that over its lifetime will probably require five to eight thousand dollars worth of just enclosure oh yeah and it's one of those situations where you know it's cute on the shelf but you don't yeah, yeah 20 the 20 dollar lizard that's going to get four feet long is not the best pet reptile oh yeah oh yeah um you know and i know and we we talked off camera for a while christian and i about uh pets and pet and you know what we like to hear about and i, I definitely find myself gravitating towards people who uh talk about education and their roles in wildlife uh their roles in in the wild their their natural history things like that really impress me more than the newest pet leopard gecko or the newest pet whatever it is and um i really am happy that you are here on our podcast because it's another avenue i don't like i said before greg i don't think we've ever had anybody on the podcast that doesn't own their own personal pet reptiles and i think that's fascinating you do so much work and you're such a uh you have such a following you've amassed such an amount of people that enjoy your content enough to follow you um, and all of your content is based on wild creatures. And I think that's phenomenal. Just so we're very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, really. You're yeah. welcome. I, um, I, I kind of, like you said, I mean, I'm kind of, I'm in the position now where I could probably, you know, get some cool species that I've always wanted, but right. we try to keep myself uh, kind of grounded in the mindset that like, this will require a good bit of responsibility. And, you know, I don't want to jump into that just prematurely. So I'm not saying, you know, at some point I might, you know, not yeah. own something, yeah. cool, hopefully one day, but just not the moment I'm like, I don't know if, you know. I'm ready. Well, you, you, you're in college, you have a lot of other stuff going on. And I think it's the, it's the appropriate response to being responsible mm-hmm. is to push off that want and that need to finish up what you're doing 
in terms of what might restrict you from being able to care for that animal 100%. Or even, you know, I, I don't know your situation. So I mean, college is expensive, maybe mm -hmm. it's a matter of, of funds. I don't know. I'm not trying to say anything negative about that. College is very expensive. I, <laughs> I definitely understand. Yeah. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, being responsible and pushing that ownership of that reptile off until you're more stable is probably the most responsible thing I've heard from a reptile keeper in 10 years. So, <laughs> or, or I should say non-reptile keeper, I guess, would be the, the way to do it. Um, yes. But yeah, and it's, it's a great decision to make, though. Uh, Greg, do you agree? Oh, yeah, 100%. And I, I've made... So... My, I'm very similar to my father in a lot of ways. Uh, like he's the one that got me into reptiles hmm. and fish. Um, I don't have any fish now, but I have kept plenty of fish in the past. Um, I was always like a huge fan of the tiger Oscar. Um, yeah. Because sure. It's like a, it's like, it's like the dog of fish. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> and from him, you know, early on with him, like buying like a reptile for me um it sort of set the example for me that if you can afford that and you want it like just get it and then the rest will come later um right. and, and now i know that that isn't the case um you know because you were talking about leopard geckos before and, and my first leopard gecko my father had bought for me i don't know how old i was um I don't know exactly what happened to it, but I know that I didn't have it very long. Mm -hmm. um, it, I know it didn't have a humid hide or access to humidity. Mm -hmm. It was on uh, sand, um, like the bag sand from the pet store, which is like right. not a good option uh, because if they can get impaction. Mm -hmm. um, And now, as an adult, um, the first snake I bought, it was an impulse purchase. Because, I mean, it, impulse to the fact that financially, it probably wasn't the best purchase to make mm -hmm. um, at the time. But I had been doing plenty of research, you know, so like um, anything that I have now was bought in good faith. Uh, or surrendered to me, um, you know, knowing that I have the ability to properly care yeah. for it, even if it's not like I have a ball python that's not my personal pet, um, and she is in like a large, uh, you know, maybe like two foot wide Tupperware container type thing. Mm. Um, you know, something very simple and something very, you know, easy to clean and maintain mm. for her well-being and my, you know, lack of expenses until I could find her a home. Um, but the importance of understanding a species and knowing what it takes to not just give it the bare minimum to survive, but what it needs to thrive, you know, is, is the ideal um, situation for me. And, and, you know, I think that's what's important about people in the reptile hobby and people like you, Christian, who are out in the wild, uh, you know, showcasing this, these reptiles and amphibians and, and what else, whatever else to people is to, to give people who want a reptile, a good representation mm -hmm. of what it's like to see that reptile in the wild. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, if I had a, a, a black rat snake, I, I can't devote my entire home to it, <laughs> but I know, I know the minimum requirements, you know, of what that snake needs to thrive, mm -hmm. um, like, you know, plenty of cover things to hide under, you know, mm -hmm. they do travel. They don't just live in a little, you know, square piece of land, like they travel a lot. So the more space, the better, and the more cover, the better. Because yeah. the more space you have, the more places that it, it wants to hide. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I don't even know what the question was. I have no idea what I'm talking about, but that's 
that's what I have to say on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. I was going to say something, Christian. Uh, oh, about the other reason why I was, you know, really looking forward to having you on was because personally and like podcast aside, um, I love like going out herping and I mm -hmm. love going off trail and exploring and flipping rocks and looking in the trees and stuff like that. But I also struggle with motivation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm trying to connect myself more to, to people like you, mm -hmm. um, whether it's people locally or people in other states or even other countries um, mm -hmm. who do that. Mm -hmm. Because when I'm, I know that when I do go out there and I'm, even if I don't find a thing, like I could spend four hours in, you know, a, a section of land looking for something and never see anything, but I feel great. Um, you know, so it, I just, you know, really want, you know, looking forward to having somebody who's out there, you know, and, and, and I don't know if you can relate at all, you know, to that, you know, lack of motivation or, um, you know, struggling to, to get out and do stuff, even if you don't want to, you yeah. know, or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, for me, sometimes like, uh, yeah, it, it can be a little hard to find motivation some days just because like I, I, I do a lot of like a lot of stuff we do is a lot of just hiking and, and a lot of times just getting a really mess muddy and messed up and hiking through creek systems and rivers and th different things like that. So sometimes, yeah, it can be a little like you're like, dang, I just want to, you know, kind of sit in today <laughs> like, and not get bit up by a million mosquitoes and have to trek through, like you know, a bunch of muddy conditions to try to find different animals and things like that. But I don't know. It's just always. It just seems like I, I'll feel like that. And then uh, I'll look outside and see it's like good sun and the weather's looking right and all that. I'm just like, all right, all right. Well, let me, you know, and it always just starts to be like, all right, well, I'm just going to take a quick walk, like, you know, just a quick walk to the creek or something like that. I'm not going to get in it. I'm not going to get, you know, anything, you know. And then all of a sudden, you know, you go down and you start seeing a couple water snakes. And you're like, oh, okay, that's cool. That's cool. And then, you know, you, you go down to another part and there's a bunch of bullfrogs hopping in the water and different things like that. And it's like, okay, cool. And then all of a sudden, all it takes for me to see like a good, slider or a cooter or, or if i'm really lucky a snapping turtle or something like that and then i'm like okay now i just want to explore the rest of the day and just see what everything's out doing and moving and stuff like that so yeah yeah i definitely can get that though for sure like the sometimes the motivation to get out and just hike around all day and flip stuff and look everywhere and check you know you're crawling all over doing all types of stuff can be a little tough sometimes yeah for sure it's definitely hard to find that motivation you know, I, 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 uh, the other side of that coin is, is, is I definitely, you know, me personally have an immense amount of responsibility to the animals that are in my care already. So if I want to say, Hey, let's go for a hike for four hours, you know, that's four hours that I don't clean feed water or whatever, um, in the rescue itself. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, you know, that puts me back a day, you know, four, yeah. four or five hours of work is what I put in at the rescue, you know, every day, no matter what. And that's just the maintenance side of it. I don't even mean the the rest of the, the rest of what it entails to run the rescue, you know, the, the talking to people and, 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 and whatnot. But it's one of those situations where you just, when the time calls for it, certain times of the year up here, so you have a lot more of a, a herping season than we do our herping season is like this big. <laughs> they come out in May and then they're all getting ready to hibernate, excuse me, burmate by August. You know, they're, they're very, very slowing down. Wow. Um, you know, you'll see, you'll see stuff through September. Don't get me wrong, but their heavy activity really slows down because August up here is very hot and mm. our, our creatures aren't used to that. They like to stay very, very hidden during the hot, hot, hot times of year. So, mm -hmm. It's like spring for a month and fall for a month. And that's it. And in between that, they're all hiding. Unless you want to go see turtles. Yeah. You know, turtles are out all year. You know, they're, they're one of the longer species that, that exist very, 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 very easily in the cooler temperatures. Snapping turtles were, yeah, this year we had a crazy ice storm in February. And uh, I had gotten a phone call from somebody that said there was a snapping turtle on the top of the ice. And I was like, just, just let it go. 
it's doing its natural thing. Whatever it, whatever reason it had to do yeah. that is why it needed to do that. Just let it go. Yeah. Um, you know, wild animals are wild for a lot longer than we've been here. Just let them be wild animals. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, if they're on a street, if they're on a road, I get it. Do something about that. But if they're in nature doing a natural thing, just let it go. <laughs> let him go. Um, Fine. He's got a plan. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's got a plan. Exactly. He knows what he wanted, or she knows what she wanted. Just let them do their thing. Um, <laughs> and it's it's a it's a it's a crazy situation to be in the Northeast and so heavily influenced by reptiles and not being able to just go out in your backyard and see them. Um, yes. The gentleman who does the hosting for our pod, or for, excuse me, for the YouTube channel that I run, um, just went to St. Augustine, Florida. And while he was there, he walked through St. Augustine Alligator Park and he did a lot or farm and he did a lot of recording and are uh, over the next couple of months, those will be released on YouTube and things like that. Um, but, you know, here he is. It's uh, what it was April. I think he went in April. Yeah, I think it was spring break in April anyway. And uh, he's looking at gators and stuff. And, and, you know, here he is in the in the deep south of Florida and well, not really deep south, but he's in the south of Florida where it's nice and warm and, you know they're still having to put heat on some of their creatures because it's not quite that warm yet. Wow. Up here in the Northeast, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't dream of putting anything outside until June 1st, you know, <laughs> oh Tur again, God. turtles, our turtles go outside in May, but aside from turtles, nothing else goes outside. Oh until, yeah. Until at least June 1st. And even then most species that we could keep outside, we have to bring in at night because our temps drop to, to the, to the fifties and sixties. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a whole different thing to be outside of, of, of a heavily, uh, a heavily colder situation here in New York state. When we have, when we have that affinity for reptiles, it's very hard to be a naturalistic herper when there aren't a lot of reptiles, <laughs> you know, dude, yeah. I see a hundred garter snakes a year and tons of black rat snakes, even though they're not black rat snakes, they're like the Northern rat snake now or something. Yeah. Something um, like that. Yeah. I've been calling them black rat snakes for 20 years. I'm probably never going to stop. Um, ah. I mean, hell, I, I still call them the wrong, the wrong Latin name. So it's, it's just, it is what it is at this point. Um, once it's committed to memory, I very rarely can, can turn that switch off especially when you're doing a stage presentation and you're talking about the native creature here in New York state that, that resembles the trans Pecos or the, or the Everglades mm -hmm. that I have in my hand. It's just second nature to bring up the black rat snake because yeah. it's a rat snake and it's black <laughs> and it's native and everybody knows it as the black rat snake. So it's not that I want to be taxonomically incorrect. It's more about I want people to understand what I'm talking about and not have to explain taxonomy to a crowd of people that may have 10 year olds in it that have no idea and they yeah. don't <laughs> <laughs> they want to know about the tongue of the snake they don't care what it's called yeah uh, so but it's it's really it's a really different uh uh it's a really di different atmosphere up here when you go to wildlife areas um you know you'll see squirrels you'll see a lot of these common species of things voles uh, groundhogs, things, things that are just, they exist everywhere. Mm. And because of our such cool temperatures, reptiles, they, they're very slow to wake up. They're very, uh, they're very uncommon to see in nature. And I'm sure Greg, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. You know, for every, for every four herping trips that I used to do, we would see, you know, maybe one reptile aside from a turtle. If I want to look at turtles, I can go look at turtles anywhere, any day. I know exactly where they are. Um, but anything aside from that, it's not, you can't count it. You can't count on those things happening, um, at least for the most part, right? Unless you, you know, we're talking like you were talking about just walking down to the creek, Christian. Mm -hmm. If I walk down to my local creek, you know, I might see a water snake. Uh, there are certain areas where, because here in New York State, everybody thinks they're a cottonmouth which by the way, they're not, they don't exist in New York state um, uh, unless somebody owns them in captivity. But uh, the, the, the general population here always says, well, there was a cotton mouth in that water and I'm assuming it met a bitter end with a shovel, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's, it's very frustrating. And I think what you're doing is, is 
at, at its heart combating that kind of attitude mm -hmm. and that kind of kill everything, ask questions later. And, you know, we, 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 we have very similar like-minded agendas behind yeah. everything that we do. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's awesome. And I really, you know, I really appreciate Greg for finding you and, and having this, this ability to do this is really pretty cool. Yeah. Um, it's very cool. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it, on that note, you know, about the, uh, I know you recently had a, like a partnership with Discovery on their Instagram. Yes. Yes. Right? I, yeah. What was that? How did that come about? Um, so how'd you, how'd you be like, you know, I, I, it's still like one of the most wild things ever to me. Um, I, I guess on TikTok, I guess I'll start there. TikTok, I was very hesitant to even start on that platform because I didn't really understand it very much. I thought it was just for like music and people making dance videos of themselves and stuff like that. And so, so it's exactly the longest time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was about to say it has to be somebody who thinks that too, because yep. I definitely thought that. And so, nope. um, yep. Um, friends are, you know, badgering me, you know, cause I was only on Instagram at the time with the crew and badgering me, oh, you got to get on TikTok, you got to get on TikTok. I'm telling you, people would love this stuff on TikTok. And I'm like, okay, okay. So make it TikTok. And, you know, I, one thing I will say that's interesting about TikTok is that the nature of the, of TikTok is just so interesting because you could have like, you know, it's kind of like on Instagram, you have to have a following to, to, to touch a following or to get a following. Whereas it's like on TikTok, you could have a pretty basic simple platform like maybe like 10 followers but if you make a video that just strikes a chord with enough people you know it just goes viral and so uh that kind of happened a couple bit of times and i would notice every so often people in the comments would tag like discovery or they tag at nat geo and it was really cool to see people do that because you know I, I i wasn't like oh you know go tag discovery i was just like you know post and stuff and people in the comments would be like Oh yeah, Discovery, check this guy out. Discovery or at Nat Geo, check this guy, Animal Planet, check this guy out. And so I was just really like, wow, okay, this is pretty neat. And so long story short, after a while of them doing that, nothing really came about of it. You know, I would just see it in the comments and say, hey, I appreciate it. And at one point, I think I noticed back in January that Nat Geo, I, I did a video with a golden orb weaver um, and it was really, really pretty spider. And I was just holding her and she's, you know, this massive gnarly looking spider walking around. I'm just like, oh yeah, look at this. And Nat Geo had commented and said, oh, we, we like this content. So I thought that was just really cool. I was like, oh, oh yeah, wow, okay, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I was like, yeah, holy cow. Like, oh wow, you know, I grew up watching you guys' documentary on King Cobra. So one of my favorite like documentaries, like, old, old, like, you know, grainy film and stuff you could find it on YouTube. It's like, King, I, I don't know. I remember, it's like, I know what you're talking about. The, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And it, it follows the male through breeding season and the feet, then the female through monsoon. They talk about, monsoon. they talk about building nests and yes, they talk, yes. yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. That is such a good documentary. To me. Oh yeah. Right 100. <laughs> so I would see stuff like that, not pay it too much in mind. So long story short, could throw, go back to, I want to say, the ending of February, beginning of March, um, Bobby and I, we worked at the same place at the time. And so uh, like as a part-time job. And, and, uh, and so <laughs> he comes in and he's like beaming ear to ear. Like he's just beaming ear to ear. And so, like I said, Bobby's like, in, Bobby's an actor as well. So I'm, I'm assuming that like he just landed another role or something like that. And he's about to tell me. So I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's, this is like, okay. And he goes, hey man, come to the back real quick. I gotta tell you something. So I'm like, okay. So yeah, you know, go to the back and he's like, hey, uh, Discovery just followed me. And I'm like, oh, cool. Like, you know, like, and I'm like, that, that's neat. Like, I was like, so what are you doing? Like, are you doing like a, a, a show with them? Like a, a documentary or something? And they want to use you as a character for, he's like, no, 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 no. They followed my caveman account. And I was like, oh, that, that's even cooler. I was like, what did they, what did, what did they want? And he's like, dude, they, uh, they sent me this video. I had taught Bobby. Bobby had, had been, so how my crew worked is I was the one who was super oh, head over heels fan, you know, fascinated with wildlife and then my other two friends Bobby and Ryland I kind of brought them into my world slowly and slowly and so they've slowly evolved from being just guys who film me with an iPhone to like right. now they're deep in a swamp with me now they're they're catching snakes with me and they're super passionate about it and so Bobby there was a video of him and we caught this snapping turtle in like this really shallow dried up kind of creek system and it was a really pretty turtle and I was uh, we did the video and I, I looked at Bobby and Bobby was like, oh, wow, like, you know, that's really neat. And I told him at the next snapping turtle I, uh, we got, I wanted 
show him how to like safely handle him. Like I wanted him to get that experience because he had been tracking snapping turtles with me like for like the last year and a half. And so he held the turtle in the video. You can see he's a little bit nervous, but he's handling it properly. So the turtle isn't like, you know, as bitey as they normally are. And he's just, he does a really, really cool little like educational bit on it. And then we just set it back on its way. So Discovery had found that video and they'd sent it to him. We're like, hey, we love this video. We, uh, uh, is there any way we could get in contact with uh, Christian? Because we wanted to talk to you guys about something and uh, social media wise. And so I'm like, we're freaking out, you know, in the back of the well, workplace. Obviously. So yeah <laughs> i'd be like i'd be like hi hey, i can't be here today i have to go home now i can't i can't work i can't work i can't do this i'm out of here bye uh, bye yeah <laughs> yeah I, we, we, <laughs> you know for those for that next hour you know and admittedly i did I, I you know i shed a couple of like tears because it felt like really wild it just felt really insane to me and so long story short a week later we're on with their social media team and they're telling us about how they would like to offer us the opportunity to create some content for them. Like just for like a kind of a one-time deal, create like a TikTok and do what they call like a virtual tour where we take their audience out and say like, Hey, we're the caveman wildlife crew. This is blah, 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 blah. We're going to be showing you about this. And so long story short, while we were developing that idea, they uh, had just launched in just how time like lined up well for us. They had just launched into a new program that they were starting where they're trying to give voices to like smaller social media platforms and just see how they, how almost it's like if we create content for them and if they like the idea and it's something that kind of aligns with what they had planned for the month, then they'll post it for us and stuff like that and give us credit. And so we partnered on with that program. And so now for the next year, we're going to be just kind of collaborators with them on social media and uh, making content for them. And if they like the content that we create for them, they'll put it on their TikTok or their Instagram or something like that. And so it's pretty wild. Our first First thing went up on April 15th, so almost a month ago now, and uh, we took them to the Piedmont region of Georgia, and uh, so, you know, I, I'm pretty lucky, like like we were talking about earlier, like with geographically where I ended up, I mean, we have crazy salamander, like amphibian biodiversity, but also like a really wide, vast array of reptiles, and then even, I didn't even get to get into all the things I wanted to, like insects, just because of the time of year, but then freshwater fish, all that stuff, and so it was a really cool experience, and um, it was just a while, you know, it was just a while, like, you know, we're, we're out here filming stuff. And for once, it wasn't just like, oh, here we are filming with like our iPhones, you know, just for like, you know, for our social media, it was like, oh, wow, we're, we're really pitching something to discovery. So admittedly, I was nervous all being, I mean, like, you know, well, I was, this is something yeah. that I, yeah, how can you not, how can yeah. you not? Yeah. <laughs> you know, cause I mean, like, like I told you before, even, you know, I was like, I, I faced backlash just even on our small social media level. So I was like, okay, right. if I don't, I'm correct on this. I already know, like, you know, you're going to have a large audience coming after you. And so thankfully it ended up doing really well and things went out really well. And uh, for what they told us that their, their audience received it pretty well. And they, uh, that their audience wants to see more from us and Good. things like that. So that's we're great. excited about that. But yeah, that's great. it's just a, I, it's a cool way to put the message out. I am super, I, I didn't know that discovery did things like that. And admittedly, I don't follow them on most social media stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm very, I put my blinders on, on social media. I usually pretty much stick to my own pages, my own, you know, the things that I admin, the things that I'm, I'm a, a big part of. I just, um, <coughs> excuse me. I pretty much leave, uh, everybody else to their own devices. I don't, I don't really want to get into battles of <laughs> politics or any of that kind of stuff, which seems to be the norm on social media nowadays. Um, and I don't really, I don't really have to, I don't want to explain to, to anyone about whether or not I knew the correct term for this. Like we were talking about the black rat snake thing a couple minutes oh, ago. Yeah. I don't want to tell people like, I don't want, I don't, I feel, I feel compelled to, to use the words that I want to use because I've been using them for, for 20 years. I don't want to, to tell somebody that it's wrong or right to say the same thing. I really don't. And at the same yeah. point in time, it, it's awesome to see uh, uh, an education based television channel that i grew up watching with sophisticated wildlife tv shows and, and so on and so forth you know i mean discovery paid some crazy amounts of money to produce a lot of those natural um, yeah na uh, what are that what are that what's the what's the series of the planet earth right that's earth. discovery yeah oh, yeah like i mean immense amounts of money went into the production of that film period and it was yeah. a great video series and it's awesome to see that these companies that are all about education are trying to um utilize the 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 uh the social media style of younger generations so that they can continue to educate through 
um, the means that the young people in this country are actually watching. So you're right. When I first looked at TikTok, I was like, this is terrible. <laughs> I, I don't want to be a part of this in any way. And I'm a, I'm a 39 year old man. What business do I have being on a platform <laughs> where all it is, is, you know, people doing dances and uh, <laughs> some of the other ridiculous things that happen on that, on that particular oh, yeah. platform are, are, are outrageously ri ridiculous. Um, yeah. But at the same point in time, I did see that there's a huge push to educate on that platform as well. And it's really awesome that people like yourself are taking that platform to a next level, to, to a better level. It's not just the dumb dances or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not that all the dances are dumb. Some of them are entertaining, but it's not about the <laughs> entertainment value. It's about education. And I find it to be remarkable that a company like Discovery Channel is saying, hey, let's utilize this person with a little bit of a following to maybe grow our attention on social media so that we can still reach people and talk about the education of wildlife, nature, things like that. You know, anytime that nature is the subject, I'm always a fan uh, <laughs> because, you know, without nature, humans don't exist. I think everyone in this world is forgetting that <laughs> fact. You yeah. know, if, if we cut down all the trees to build a bunch of houses, we're not going to breathe, everybody. They haven't figured out how to make that change, and it's not going to happen in my lifetime. So let's, you know, pay a little more attention to what's going on outside. Um, <laughs> we're not going to get into the de debates of climate change and all of these other things on our podcast. That's not what this is about. But yeah. at the same point in time, if you are aware of the natural world, period, if you find something that you enjoy about it, and it gets your butt outside, even if it's sitting in your backyard looking at a robin or a blue jay, it doesn't matter. Because once you find something that you enjoy outside, you're going to want to pay more attention to outside. Mm -hmm. Regardless, it could be a snow leopard from, you know, from a, 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 a oh, man, I'm, I'm definitely on the spot now because snow <laughs> leopards are from the Himalayas. And I just forgot that for a second. But it's uh, if you know, it could be a snow leopard being adorable from the Himalayas, or it could be any any species of creature. You know, I know people who are like, I don't really like reptiles, and I was like, well, that's okay. Uh, you know, do you like birds? Do you like uh, aardvarks or anteaters, or do you do you like raccoons or possums? You know, I, it doesn't matter what you enjoy. It's all about finding something that you care about, learning that thing, and how that thing is integral I I integral to the to the environment that it lives in will then maybe show you that you play a part in your environment as well and there's decisions that you can make that both affect it positively and negatively and let's hopefully hope that if enough people on tiktok watch discovery and yourself christian that they really start to understand what is going on outside yeah yeah it's a really big uh, big problem uh hey brian what's the time situation we're good Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just listen, here. I, didn't... I have no, uh, uh, you know, not this is totally breaking character for me, but I have absolutely nothing planned until about three, so I'm I'm good. Well, if everyone... you said something about forty minutes. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I I I uh, redid the Zoom thing for I yeah, changed I my I changed my card on that, so it was uh it oh, was okay. Yeah, it was a little bit ridiculous. I I again, my card was stolen, and uh, the card that paid for Zoom was the card that I had to cancel. <laughs> got it yeah <laughs> so oh, now that so christian you were talking about uh <laughs> um it's enough about you brian talk about christian <laughs> <laughs> thanks Greg. appreciate that, Look, that listen, awesome i never segue. you did a super I never segue talk. there i never talk i never know when to start talking so when something <laughs> comes to me talk. now i'm just like i'm gonna start talking <laughs> um, so <laughs> um earlier on you're talking you know talking about you know, you follow like a wide variety of people like in the reptile hobby. Um, and I've said this before, I hate the word hobby. Uh, Brian, yeah. Brian, where'd you go? I will be, I will be <laughs> right um, back. Uh, uh, you know, you talked about, you know, following different people in the reptile hobby or different mm -hmm. types of, uh, what's, oh my God, like segments, different yeah. chapters or different pieces of, of it. Um, do you have any thoughts on like 
reptile like breeders? Uh, like, you know, that's something that I've actually had people on my, my team ask me myself, because as they started following like more, like get like, you know, you know, as you know, like once you start getting into kind of a niche on Instagram or any social media, you start to see more and more of that type of content. Cause you know, the yeah. algorithm. And so a lot of my friends would ask me like, you know, what do you think about this guy or, or this thing or this part of the, the, like the, you know, reptile keeping, you know, because da 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 da. And you know, my only, my thought on it is that I, I, I'm still heavily fascinated by it. And like I said, I, I feel like it's almost like I, 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 I'm a part of the, the keeping lifestyle, but from afar almost, like I said, cause I, I, I right. I'm fascinated by it. I love seeing people with, you know, really cool morphs of all pythons. And, you know, I love seeing, you know, all, all the, the cool different types of animals that people own and, you know, try to breed. And I think, and even a lot of it, I mean, there's, there's really some cool things of like captive breeding, you know, efforts for species that are even endangered and things that I've, that I've noticed and things like that. Yeah. Like, I remember even just with things like, I remember when I was a kid, I would go on like some of the reptile uh, keeping forums. And it was like, I think it was like Mangashan, like pit vipers seemed like they were like, almost like what extinct or something, right? Like they were very, very extirpated. Right. And now it almost seems like now when I get on there, it seems like almost a lot of people have them. Like it just, you know, and it was like, a, it was like, a, it's a weird thing. It's like, or a, 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 a lot more people have them now, just things like that. So I guess my whole take on it has always just been like, I, I of course am very happy and more passionate about proper husbandry and keeping. Like when I see people who have proper setups and they aren't, or, or especially some of the people I follow when, when you have hots, but they're for a reason, like, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're educational, like animals or they're ven used in venom research or something like that. I'm, I'm obviously a lot more like, oh, wow, that's cool. Versus the guy or some of the people who I've seen that are just, oh yeah, I have a cobra, you know, and it's, and it's in this little tiny little cube and it doesn't look, you know, happy at all. So I guess my take on it is that if the animal's husbandry and everything like that is, is being put as a priority, I, I have really no pejorative comments or any bad view of, of reptile keeping at all, really. It's, it only comes into play when it's like, okay, well, here's somebody with bad husbandry, or of course, you know, we have all know what's going on in Florida with people some sometimes releasing pets and now you have invasives and things like that. You know, I, I'm, that's, that's always just kind of been my stance on it. It's kind of what I've always told the crew. It's like, I don't have a, cause you know, once again, one day I, I, you know, hopefully, you know, when I'm set up in the right way, I'd love to own a couple of reptiles myself possibly, but at the end of the day, that's kind of where I stand on it. Not yeah. having a firm ground, but other than like, Hey, like, you know, people, People, people are doing some really cool stuff. There are some really great keepers out there, people who are passionate about reptiles and they, they, they put husbandry at, at utmost priority. And you, yeah, as a result, like especially the ones that do create content, people get to see some really fascinating and really interesting animals that they didn't even know existed in a lot of cases. And they get to see them up close with people who like own them. And they're like, wow, so that, that's actually pretty cool versus, you know, when you have the couple bad eggs in that batch that are, you know, not doing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically my thought on that too. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and especially I, I definitely like to highlight like people who are passionate about like the conservation part mm -hmm. of reptiles, people who actually will breed reptiles that are, are threatened or endangered. Yeah. Um, you know, and and with the purpose of re releasing. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. or, or re reintroducing um a, a, a species that's like dwindling away reintroducing yes. them into the wild you know in hopes that you know they can make a comeback and, and i mean to me that's super important like there's so many important things to do right now but you know the people that are focusing on that type of work you mm -hmm. know i i admire that you know i love that Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan. That actually reminds me like the coolest thing I've gotten to do to date just because of anything, because of caveman or whatever was, uh, back in January, we got to, we sent some emails out to, or back in October, we sent some emails out to the Orient society and mm. like a herbological, uh, herpetological, like conservation initiative in the Southeastern United States, like where I am. And one of their keystone species that they highlight conserving is the Eastern indigo snake. Yep. And so that was, I guess, you know, a snake that I, you know, I'm pretty sure all of us pretty much admire and revere and like, wow, that's just oh, a yeah. really incredible animal. Yeah. And uh, we got to go down and visit them at the central Florida zoo where they have like the world's only 
re um, introduction type program where they're captively breeding the snakes and then reintroducing them, releasing them back into the wild. And it was just incredible to see those snakes just up close and in person. And then like seeing the babies that they're growing up and, you know, they're telling us how like, okay, once they hit this size and this weight, we're going to go release them out into some place in the natural areas where they've been extirpated to try to hopefully rebuff and re, you know, replenish the populations of these snakes out there. And so, I mean, while they're not private keepers, of course, that that's just, it's just a cool example of like, oh, wow, yeah. like there's some really cool work being done in reptile husbandry and different things like that to help save endangered species. So, yeah. yeah. Now, do you know Noah Fields at all? Because I know he's in Georgia. Yeah, I do. I, I know, no, I've been out in the field with him once and I want to again very soon, hopefully this season. Like I, I keep in touch with him here and there, like uh, just send, I'll like swap the bonus store and send a DM to him. But he is by far one of the coolest, like most down to earth, like people I've ever met in this field. Like, I mean, you know, I got, I, I just, we just went out to a, a local park uh, together that is pretty hot with all types of herbs and stuff like that. And it was just, it was just really fun. Like just really fun. Like he's just, he's really open. And I was asking him about just different things from, it seems like I was like, dude, it seems like from your videos, everything you flip just has something insane under it. And I was like, I can't, I can't, I could be in the ideal habitat and flip everything and just not find a single thing. And it was literally, I can't make it up. Like, uh, I, I just asked him the question. He goes, uh, yeah, you know, I just kind of like flip whatever I see that looks good. Uh, like, for example, this, and there's like this stone brick on the ground, like on the side of this hill. He's like, for example, like something like this, and he flips it and right under it is like a four inch, like my life or like red salamander. Like I was, so I was like <laughs> freaking out. I was like, holy crap. Like, and it was like a massive one. He was like, this might be one of the biggest pseudo triton I've ever found. And I was like, dude, what the heck? And so I, I just set off for like a really great day. We were out there. We found a couple of like, I think we found a couple of gray rats. And then um, I, I found him an Eastern King and that like that, if you, if you follow him, you know that those are like his things, King snakes, yeah. the Eastern King. So like, I found him one of those. So I was super excited about that. And, you know, it was just a really fun day, but yeah, he's just a really cool dude. And he's, and you could tell he's super passionate about what he does. Like he's just, he's yeah. really down to earth and he's very much open to just like, like people asking questions and giving out any information that he knows. So yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. <clears throat> but yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anybody else. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anybody else in the herpes scene that I've. Uh, um, I don't know if you guys know Wild Attractions on Instagram. Um, he he's like a, he's a really cool guy, Andrew Rossini. Um, I met those guys before. Um, they're really cool. Like, uh, got to get out there in the field with them and herb around and just like, uh, it, it's it's cool to meet definitely uh some other herbers in the in the hobby that are or that are down to earth and not gatekeeping in a way i always tell yeah. people like, i i love i love the the advent of of social media and the ease of what what we can do now yeah and the people we can connect with uh, i think you and i were talking before uh we started recording about it how social media has opened up a world of reptile keeping that was never there before the the ability to share information so quickly with other yes. humans um not to mention that but you know just like what we're doing right now being able to film excuse me, being able to record this while we are talking <laughs> and have it for, you know, we're just a couple of reptile people. This is, yeah. you know, we're nothing, we're nothing fancy, nothing great. We're just a couple people, all three yeah. of us who really yeah. enjoy talking about animals in yeah. general. But now we have a, 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 a platform, whichever this gets released on, you know, it's going to be audio and, and video at some point, but uh, <clears throat> the, the scenario playing out where somebody who might live in Texas could watch this video. Someone who lives in Singapore could watch this video yeah. and, and realize that like, you know, Hey, maybe I can pick up a camera phone and I can go out in my backyard and I can share with the world what happens here. Yep. And then of course, all of us are going to subscribe because he lives in Singapore and has some amazing creatures. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's just, it's, and that's that's what the awareness is. That's that's how this, this social media can be used for such positive things is just being able to say, hey, this is in my backyard. Here you go. Mm -hmm. You know, you 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 in Georgia have a timber rattlesnake, which uh, recently, if I'm not mistaken, has gotten and gained its own species uh, yeah. to be an official cane break rattlesnake at this point. By the way, that's the only species of rattlesnake that actually scares me. Um, you know, really? I, I, yeah. Beads of sweat, man. I can work with the timbers up here in New York, no problem. But cane breaks, I don't know why. 
Wow. Every time, I think it's because I saw a video a long time ago about uh, a gentleman who was bitten on the hand and they had to, he, his body swelled so quickly that they had to cut his skin open so it didn't tear. And ever since I saw that, I was like, nope, I don't really want to touch that snake. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, we I've I've worked with them. I've had them around. It's not like I never have, but I still really genuinely just could not. Beads. Of, it was like watching uh, I was watching Steve Irwin with the Mamba where he's like, I'm shaking like a leaf. Yeah, you're dealing with like death. I'm dealing with a tiny little rattlesnake and I'm like dying inside. But uh, <laughs> and luck, you have to while, bringing that up made me laugh really hard in my head just now because Steve Irwin, I can remember him saying something. Uh, I'd, I'd rather get punched in the face by Mike Tyson than take a hit on the leg from that. And he was talking about a, a, a Western Diamondback, I think it was. And mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, you play with common brown snakes. Like, forget the Western Diamondback. You get bit by a common brown, you're done, man. <laughs> like, you're just, that's the end of it. And I could, I'll never forget that. But it goes to show you exactly when you're comfortable with something, you can share that something with everyone else very easily. Whereas mm -hmm. here we are in the United States and we're totally comfortable with rattlesnakes. Rattlesnakes oh, are yeah. nothing. They're yeah. everywhere. Every oh, yeah. state has rattlesnakes. Who cares? Yeah. You know? And yeah. he was like, and he was like completely like, I'm not, I can't, I don't want, I, nope. I would yeah. rather get, okay. I mean, yeah. A little hematoxic venom never did anybody that, that bad. You know, people survive bites in the wild of, of Western diamondbacks without yeah. any problem, you know, yeah, without any treatments. You know, I've heard stories of people who like, they were bitten and they were like lost in the woods for five days and they still didn't die, you know, but yeah, common Brown. I don't know why I found that so funny. And common, okay. common <laughs> Brown's kill you in 10 minutes, you know, it's nothing. Yeah. They only find them like garter snakes here in the United States, you know, of course in our country, in our country, if that was what was going on, there'd be a, there'd be a lot more, a lot more people getting bit by venomous snakes. I'll tell you that. Oh yeah. Our, our country, we're, we're the ones that want to go play with everything. They're the, they're their country. They call the experts in and they come and remove those snakes. You know, oh, yeah, Here yeah, we're yeah. like, no, I got this. I got this. Like that, that gentleman who jumped on the gator in the, in the golf course when he was like 60 years old, dude, what do you do? Why are you even jumping on the gator anyway? He's, that, gonna, that, he's not going to bother you. <laughs> that video will never cease to amaze because I, I, for the longest time I thought it was fake. Cause I was like, there's no way this older guy just jumped on this. Like, I mean, what was that gator? Like 10 foot or something crazy like that? Like the thing was massive. I think it was like eight feet at least. Yeah. And I mean, you know, like I'm a 300 pound, six foot man. And I don't think I would jump on an eight foot gator by myself. <laughs> and I, you know, I've been on top of gators. Let's be very clear. But at the same point in time, like, I don't think I would make that educated decision of, <laughs> all right, I think, uh, I think I need to remove this gator that's not bothering anybody on my own, you know, but that's, that's, that also goes to what you are sharing on your, on your, uh, social media stuff. It's all about education. Yeah. You know what? Maybe that guy. He watched Steve Irwin do it and he thought it wasn't going to be a big deal. And he really thought that gator might pose a threat to those kids. Yeah. Right. So he thought he was doing the right thing because he saw someone do it. Now that's a hundred percent the opposite of the information that I would love to share in the wild. Yeah. Cause when you're in the wild, I mean, I do a lot of scout events. I do a lot of scout events and I do a lot of uh, educational lectures for younger groups of children. And you know, my, my end all of all of my, presentations are what do you do if you see a snake in the wild and you leave it alone period yep. That's yeah it. there's no other there's no other bubble you know there's no other scenario that plays out okay for both the keep the you know the person and the snake yeah leave it alone because you never know what it could be here in our backyards it could be i mean an eastern uh, uh hognose if you're allergic to bee venom if you take a bite from an Eastern hognose, you can have an anaphylactic reaction. So yeah. even something that you think you can identify a hundred percent as a benign species could still pose a threat, especially if you're eight, 10, 12 years old and you know, you're small. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I, you know, I never want to advocate going out and just picking everything up. I also don't really want people to go out and like flip over every stone and oh, yeah. not put it back, you know, because I can tell you, I go to certain places and it's like 10 years ago, nobody knew about them. Mm -hmm. Now you walk through there and there's like, you know, those stupid towers of stones. And I'm like, Jesus 
what just leave nature alone just yeah it's a double-edged sword just like everything else in this world you have the people who are trying to protect things and you have the people who are trying to like not do what's right for the environment um and you know just like reptile keeping uh greg you were talking earlier about the hobby or the industry as a whole it's a great you know we've made exponential leaps and bounds towards positive thinking as reptile keepers you know moving away from racking systems moving into naturalistic setups moving into a a, a bioactivity where the enclosure takes care of itself um so on and so forth but at the same point in time you still have an entire group of people that think racks are you know perfectly okay and and they don't cause any emotional duress which I'm not even going to get into that topic of conversation really, but at the, at the, you know, when we didn't know anything about snakes originally, but I will tell you now, you Christian, were talking about an Eastern Indigo. If you put an Eastern Indigo in a rack system, it would drive itself insane. It would rub its face completely raw because that is an intelligent, very curious and very, very, very large species of colubrid that has an immense amount of range within their home territory. And they're never, still they don't stay in the same place and if you put them in a what would be a typical size for say maybe a ball python or a king snake or or something that would economically be be housed in something similar that eastern indigo is not going to survive very well oh yeah um you know and the same goes for very smart snakes like king cobras we talked about earlier but at the end of the day you know we're only just really beginning to scratch the surface of how intelligent these creatures are And if you call yourself a keeper, but you're not willing to listen to the change that's happening in the reptile industry, and you're not willing to listen to that, and you're still, nope, it's okay, they can live in rack systems, you're not really a reptile keeper. You're not paying attention to the actual science of husbandry, of of keeping something healthy and active. Um, And, you know, if we're supposed to be active, can you only imagine, right? Yeah, I'm supposed to only eat three meals a day and I'm not supposed to drink beer and I'm not supposed to do all these other things. But at the end of the day, I make choices that keep me at the weight and size that I am. And it's the same thing that you're doing to a reptile that lives in a small shoebox and you're not allowing them to be natural. You know, not saying that shoeboxes don't work for young or, or babies or, or what have you. And I'm not saying that they don't work in a pinch for an emergency mm-hmm. situation or for sterilization pro- pr- purposes. You know, I'm not saying that they don't work at all. I'm just saying that if it's an acceptable situation for you, uh, then you're not paying attention to the actual science that's changing in this industry and in this hobby. Um, and I, I, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm drastically floored all the time continuously about the people greg that you find and we talk to on this podcast by their push to get out of the racking system mentality get get into the more naturalistic vivarium setups and um be more responsible for the intelligent uh be more responsible for the mental health of their kept versus Mm -hmm what what other people have done for most of the time that i've been in this hobby in this industry you know it's yeah. just a really good good sign and you know you're a, a very good example of how it's changing um i'm not going to say how old you are unless you want to but you I'm are <laughs> you are substantially younger than i am and it's great to see that your your situation is i don't need to keep something in captivity right this minute I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to educate people about what's going on in the wild, what these animals do, what they are, where they're from. And you're doing it right from your backyard. So that's also obviously phenomenal. And I'm totally envious. Um, (laughs) But uh, at the same time, you know, you're not like pushing the next best pet reptile. You're not pushing the, 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 um, the industry standard in, 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 in pets, you know, your, your content is, no different than all of the people who I aspired to look up to when I was younger, um, Austin Stevens, Mark O'Shea, E. Croc Hunter himself, Steve Irwin. It's just a remarkable switch in a lot of the younger generations that I see um, on social media who like, because Kim Kardashian got a bearded dragon, they did. So <laughs> it's really nice to see that someone in your age group, no offense, is very, very, very responsible in their decisions with animals um you know at the end of the day i do run a rescue 
I do have my own reptiles that I do keep as my own personal pets, but because I have a shelter mentality of keeping reptiles, I also see a lot of the really bad stuff that happens in this industry. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's heartbreaking sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, uh, bearded dragon is crippled for life because it didn't have a light, you know, yeah. just, just a, a, a miserable situation. So it's not coming from a, 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 a my, my statements don't come out of negativity or mean or, 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 or trying to be derogatory in any way to anyone. It's just a matter of, you know, if there's a better way to do it, wouldn't you want to, if you're a reptile keeper, period. Mm-hmm. sums up the whole thing i just took like 10 minutes to say for no reason <laughs> um i'm long-winded sorry we we, no, we hear, christian we hear we um my, my uh my youtube host mark and i we don't uh you you said long story short a few times today and I, I have to remark on this um we don't say long story short we say well short story long and that's every <laughs> all the time that's, that's that. what we say back and forth <laughs> to each other constantly uh, and it's absolutely ridiculous uh, you know we're, we're no, that we're, was great like i said we're just a bunch of reptile people out there trying to be reptile people i think you're frozen up oh, there we go okay there we go. okay yeah. back Sorry. what did you say yep. uh I, we're just reptile people out there being reptile people Heck right? yeah. and and you know we just want to share what we do with everyone else and or bug people or fish people right <laughs> or right right yeah. right any any people any people, although you can keep most of the bugs to yourself there, Christian. Um, I'm not against bugs. I'm not. They feed my reptiles. They're very useful. And I know that they are literally keystone species and you have to pay attention to insect life to make sure things are going on. But I loathe, loathe mosquitoes beyond all and anything on this planet that I don't like. It is mosquitoes. Mosquitoes I, uh, and centipedes. I, I was sorry, remarking, Christian, but centipedes, I'll pass. We were remarking earlier about Jeremy Wade, another very amazing naturalistic sport fisherman. Uh, his I say naturalist because he he really does borderline on that conservation. Yeah. Want to be, you know, uh, 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 animal person, you know, comparatively to say a sports fisherman that's like fishing for bass competitively. Yeah. Um, and he uh, we we were talking about him earlier. And it was about the, uh, his trip into the Amazon, I believe it was. And, you know, he, 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 I can remember him saying, you know, he was petrified of being in the Amazon rainforest because of the mosquitoes, because of things like malaria and, 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 and certain things that he could catch. And, you know, I, I don't think that ever left me. <laughs> and uh, I, I was in uh, the Bahamas earlier this year and I was like, oh, that's a mosquito. Oh God, what am I going to do now? <laughs> Like I, I was freaking out. I mean, I, I'm not, I, you know, I, I over exaggerate and embellish a little bit, but it was, it was definitely, you know, a, a statement that took me back a couple steps after a, a mosquito from a, I don't want to say foreign country, but a mosquito from a different area than I'm used to landed on yeah. me and bit me. And I was like, oh, I don't really like this. And I could only imagine if you watch anybody who's ever been in the Amazon rainforest at night and they have lights on, forget it. Like you look like you're wearing mosquito clothing. Like they're just <laughs> everywhere. Freaks me out. And I don't really like bug spray. I don't no. really like to use it. I, mean, so it, I it's hate a, bug yeah. spray. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a catch twenty two for me, depending on the time of year and where I may go. Um, it's I funny can... you say that because uh, we just posted a video earlier this week. Uh, we were out in the field, and at nighttime, I don't know what was going on, but we we're on this creek system, and the whole entire shoreline, like right where the creek meets the water, is just littered. Yep. with like mosquitoes like just lit i've never i've never seen anything like this in my life i was like what in the world is going on and so we have headlamps on and, and high-powered flashlights in our hands so they just you know it doesn't take long before yep. they're all in your face and so of course right in that area like right when we found these mosquitoes look down and right at my feet is this beautiful midland water snake like bright orange and like very rarely nice. around here you get them that they look like corn snakes almost like they're that orange right, and right. Ridiculous. yeah and so we're trying to do a video on this snake and like these mosquitoes are just crowding my face, flying in my mouth, all this stuff like that. And so oh. we just took a video of us in the middle of it. And it was pretty funny. Everybody in the comment section was like, that is like my worst nightmare like that. Yep. But the interesting thing was they didn't bite. Not a Thank single you. one. They, they were probably fresh, uh, fresh hatchlings. Yeah. Um, it was probably like a hatchling bloom. You know what? Uh, I know from, from, I know from experience that, there's certain times of the year where you will end up with a tidal shift or a, or a lessening of water as the temperatures get warmer. And as Mm -hmm. soon as you get that first rainstorm, it's like, 
boom, there's a million mosquitoes just because the water level reaches their eggs again and they all they all hatch or do their thing. I don't know. It's, I'm not, I'm not yeah. a scientist. I'm just a reptile guy, but it's <laughs> definitely one of those situations where I would be like, Nope, we're not, we're going home now. See you later. Sorry, Mr. Water snake. You're beautiful, but I am not dealing with that. I just, it's uncomfortable. You know, it's, <laughs> I it's know. Just super uncomfortable. It's not, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine it. Yeah. Uh, I go, I go fishing on a couple local rev- reservoirs here and I, I do uh, a, a bunch of outdoor stuff. You know, we film on the Creek systems here and, and all, all kinds of crazy things. And most of the time I'm fine during a day. Cause you know, you get your odd mosquitoes here and there during a day, but at night, no way. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I just, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't like the, I'd be spitting every five minutes cause there'd be mosquitoes <laughs> in my mouth. I just wouldn't like the footage. I'd have to be like, no, we got to do this again when it's not, me (laughs) yeah i i definitely applaud you for your your um i definitely applaud you for your ability to go out in nature bring nature into people's homes and uh, do it in a format that really fits the youth of america today you know you're you're putting yourself out there to to get bit to to um you know do the do the things that i think are going to push a younger generation into understanding what's going on in nature. Um, you know, we, we, this planet is our only planet. As far as I know, I, I haven't, haven't, haven't heard anybody say, you know, Hey, you know, Jeff Bezos hasn't like created a colony on the moon yet or, or <laughs> Elon Musk, you know? And uh, I think we're, we're getting to a point of no return if we don't yeah. start really learning and paying attention to what's going on outside. I know I said that already, but I'm going to be a broken record about it. Any chance I get, perfect. any chance I get, I will put that right back in um, because we really should be paying attention to outside. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a perfect segue to, I was going to ask uh, you, Christian, about what you're doing now is, is awesome. Um, we've said it a million times, but say like five, 10 years from now, oh. like, what do you... <laughs> I mean, what do you picture for yourself anyway, as far as your career mm. when dealing with, you know, nature, you know, like with what yeah. you're doing now, like, what, what do you want it to be? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah, I know exactly. I don't want to take you from the moment. I, I, you know, I appreciate your, you know, in the moment, like, you know, but just like a goal, you know, or, or a dream for, you know, your future when it comes to this stuff? Oh, you know, I've, I've sat and I thought about it a good bit. And if you had to ask me, you know, my ideal, like my ideal setup, it would just be that I would hope that the caveman wildlife crew evolved from just like a social media platform thing to a fully developed well-streamed conservation effort where we're doing not only the educational outreach that we're doing now, but we're really hopefully able to get our, our, our hands on some land and putting it back into re, reintroducing the Savannah Longleaf Pine to the Southeastern United States. It's, a, it's an imperiled ecosystem that uh, we learned about a lot with the Eastern Indigo Snake. And of course, when you, know, when you learn about one species, you have to learn about the habitat that it's in. And we learned a ton about the, the Longleaf Pine. And when we were down on this, uh, the Orient Society's Indigo Snake Preserve, which is like, you know, this thousand, thousands of thousands of acres of land and just, they're trying to, they do prescribed burns to try to bring back the habitat and different things like that. And so we saw a couple of plots of like pristine Savannah Longleaf Pond that they had on there. And I mean, it's just beautiful. Like, I mean, just the golden, just golden waves of grass and these long, beautiful pine trees. And you could just imagine the pine snakes and the gopher tortoises and the eastern diamondbacks and the indigo snakes whipping around on the property in there. And I just really, I'd really, I guess, in essence, would just, and then, you know, among other things, like, you know, of course, you know, the like saving turtles and different things like that. But I felt like I, it was so easy for myself growing up to attach myself to all these colors is like save the turtle save the amazon and things like that because you know there are beautiful places across the world that you want to see but i never knew that just in my own state two hours down south from where i am there is a habitat that went from 90 million acres to like less than three percent of what it is now like less than three percent is old growth like you know and we're trying frantically to 
do prescribe burns now because we understand that now this is a habitat that needs fire. So the wire grass burns down and spreads its seeds and does all this interesting thing. And people don't know that. Like, you know, yeah. even when you hear a longleaf pine savanna, people think of like a forest, I believe, like kind of like a, a more right. like, yeah, for, but it's really, it's no, it's like, it's, you know, you think about like the Serengeti in Africa, that golden flowing grass, but with just pine trees sticking up in, in individual plots. And it's just mm -hmm. incredible. So five to 10 years from now, you know, I, I'd love to see the caveman wildlife crew doing more hands-on conservation work. Like, you know, I, of course, you know, any call I get or any chance I get from a friend who tells me there's a snapping turtle in the middle of the road, or there's a snake, you know, somewhere that needs to be relocated, you know, I, I try to be on it, you know, I try to be there and get there and help that animal out. And I, those are, those are quite honestly, you know, yeah, you know, jumping in a pond and catching a snapping turtle is cool, but for me, it's just way cooler saving, like getting to say I saved one, you know, from, from getting yeah. killed, you know, something like that. But <laughs> I can't say, you know, yet that we're, a, we're, 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 our focus is conservation, but we're not a conservation effort yet because we haven't, you know, we haven't been able to, to do hands-on conservation work. So I just hope that with the credibility that I'll get from school and just maybe pursuing down this, this route more that we'll be able to actually save habitat and ecosystem and some beautiful species and just get to keep touching the audience in an educational way that we have been. And hopefully it gets larger and larger, but, you know, I, Man, that's it's like that's like a that's like a tough question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I was growing a positive. That, that that ding was like a perfect, you know. Oh yeah, that was to perfect that too. I was like, oh my god, it's it's happened. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, that was that was Christian just made it. We just that, watched Christian make it. <laughs> that's right. That was the inspiration <laughs> news at work right there. Yeah, that was that that was a light bulb moment like crazy. Um, but yeah, no, this is this has been great. Uh, you know, and Christian you are a conservationist you're you're don't don't sell yourself short what you do is important and teaching people about outside because outside is disappearing is a very important thing and uh just the fact that at your your age you know that there are habitats two hours away from you that are in peril believe me i wish i knew that at your age as well and and i mean <laughs> you know here in new york we have a lot of estuarian habitats that are that are are really starting to degrade yeah. um because everybody wants that new beachfront property <laughs> you know you see it through jersey and you hear about it in new jersey a lot more than you do in new york but you know our sand dunes are all being washed away and and that's crucial habitat for a lot of nesting birds and and, and uh, sea turtles and, and all kinds of other things um but you know when i was younger and we were vacationing on long island i didn't have a clue no clue no. and unfortunately that's part of the putting your blinders on and walking through the world without paying attention outside mm -hmm. you know it's a really really big situation um and I really appreciate the fact that you you are humble enough not to call yourself a conservationist, but you really are. And you and your team yeah. are working diligently every day to do exactly what conservationists would dream of is getting this machine, which may not work, this machine right here. You're teaching people about wildlife on the thing that's in their pocket. It's mm -hmm. not family night. You don't have to sit down at the TV show. Yeah. It's not, it's not uh, the hour long uh, uh, crocodile hunter series. You know, it's not, <laughs> you're not looking at commercials. You're not doing any, you're sitting there and these people can see your stuff with a flick of a wrist, simple, open an app and it's there and it's in their face and they can't avoid it. They can't, you know, say it doesn't exist. They can't, you know, you're doing it. Don't say you're not doing it. Yeah. You are doing it. Yeah. The, <clears throat> the, the, the conservation, you know, the, the physical part of it, you know, of conservation, you know, is, is obviously necessary, but like the first part, like the ground base of conservation is education, mm -hmm. you know, so you, you, you have, you have to do, we have to do what we can to get people to appreciate, you know, our, you know, surroundings and, and our habitats. Um, if not, then what, what does conservation matter if more people are focused on the beach house um, you know, and, and less, you know, focused on the, the, the Eastern indigo snake, you know, the conservation is sort of, you know, continuing to hit a crossroads, you know, so that's why I think like part of what you're doing, um, you know, is absolutely hundred percent conservation, you know, so. Thank you. Um, Thank yeah, you. So, but it was, you know, it was awesome to talk to you. Like, I'm really glad that this happened. Yeah, me too. Um, me too, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, is there anything uh, else that you wanted to say or do you want to plug any of your your socials before we go? Um, 
uh, I, I just want to say thank you so, so much for you guys just allowing me the opportunity to sit down and speak with you today. I really appreciate it. This is a, this is a lot of fun and it was cool. Anytime. Just have a cool conversation. I really appreciate it. Hopefully if I'm ever up in your area, I get to visit the rescue or something like that. Like, oh yeah, know, absolutely. Just let yeah. me know.